Hello and welcome to the coronavirus lockdown live stream, the show that brings welcome levity to the end of the world, lifting the spirits of many of you currently in self-isolation by infecting as many as possible with comfort and distraction as the apocalypse unfolds. I hope you're all doing well. Apologies for the lateness, which is due to technical difficulties. And without going into details, those technical difficulties may mean that my video is glitchy. So please, can you tell me, viewers, um, what my audio and video is sounding like? Is it really bad? Is it tolerable? Oh, no sound here. That is bad. Gosh. <laughs> Does that mean I have to do the whole thing again? Why would it not be on? Everything seems on at my end. Audio is perfect, says Arthur, who waits in the green room. Audio and video is good. Gosh, that's a relief. That would mean I'd have to do the whole thing again, and it wouldn't be the first time I've done that. Now, I have a wonderful panel, a very fine-looking panel, if I, if I can delve into the aesthetics of what they're looking like. Most of them seem to be dressed, and they're waiting there in the green room, ready to spring into action at a few clicks of my mouse, pad, touch pad, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I first of all want to ease us in with a reading of a book. I was reading before God is Not Great, Christopher Hitchens. It just occurs to me that while the wisdom of Hitch is very much appreciated by myself, I don't want to alienate too many viewers who um, might not be tuning in necessarily to hear um, arguments for atheism and that sort of thing. So I'm going to switch to reading a portion from Take Back Your Life by Yanya Lalich and Madeline Tobias, because it occurs to me that many of you tuning in will be from a, 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 a cult background, as it were. You'll be survivors from cultic ideology and maybe at a time such as this advice might be appreciated so i'm reading from page 89 uh, in the chapter leaving a cult each person's cult experience is different some may dabble with a meditation technique yet never get drawn into taking advanced courses or moving to a group's ashram Others may quickly give up everything, including college, career, possessions, home and family, to do missionary work in a foreign country or to move into cult lodgings. Still others may have been born or raised in a cult, never having the choice to join or be part of the group. Uh, after cult involvement, some people carry on with their lives seemingly untouched more typical are those who experience a variety of emotional or psychological difficulties, ranging from inability to sleep, restlessness, and lack of direction, to panic attacks, memory loss, and depression. To varying degrees, former members may feel guilty, ashamed, enraged, lost, confused, betrayed, paranoid, panicked, sad, unreal, or as if they are living in a sort of fog. Professionals who work with cult survivors note that it can take from one to two years for former members to return to their former level of adaptation, while some may have psychological breakdowns or remain psychologically scarred for years. Once again, those born and raised in a cult will face a whole different set of challenges and adjustments. The following case examples highlight the range of responses. Cynthia N., age 38, spent 12 years in a new age group where she achieved a high level of leadership. She left because, quote, I didn't feel right staying there anymore. I knew something was terribly wrong with the group and thought I'd go crazy if I stayed, end of quote. She moved in with her parents, resumed college, and had a good job when she entered therapy five years after her cult departure to address some of the residual issues. 
Cynthia started therapy for treatment of a mild depression, complaining that life seemed rather flat and uninteresting. She had difficulty making friends and trusting people, and she felt she had missed out on life, particularly compared to others her age who were married, had children, owned their own homes, and were advanced in their careers. After three months of intensive coursework and counselling in the same group as Cynthia, Brian R. was hospitalised because of a suicide attempt. An 18-year-old college freshman at the time of his recruitment, his classwork deteriorated immediately after he got involved with the group. He began hallucinating, seeing and hearing his leader talk to him, and he feared that he was being possessed by demons. Brian's behaviour prompted the group to ask him to leave. He was becoming a hindrance. Because he wasn't allowed to stay, he believed that he had to kill himself in order to be reborn and join the group again. Brian had no history of emotional difficulty prior to joining and had a good relationship with his family and peers. After hospitalisation, medication and outpatient psychotherapy, Brian is now doing well is back in school and has a part-time job. Assessing the damage. Why are some people so damaged by their cult experience while others walk away seemingly unscathed? Why do some have psychotic episodes or attempt suicide after leaving the group while others are able to restore order to their lives? There are no simple answers to these questions because a number of variables influence post-cult adjustment. In Chapter 2, we presented certain personality traits and or vulnerabilities that can hinder or enhance susceptibility to cult recruitment and conversion. Still other factors affect ongoing vulnerability and susceptibility while in the group. All these factors shape and influence the impact of a cult experience on the individual and the potential for subsequent damage. In assessing this impact, three different stages of the cult experience, before, during, and after, need to be examined. The material in this section is based on observations from our work, the experience of other counsellors, and human development research. Before cult involvement. Vulnerability factors that exist before cult involvement include a person's age, prior history of emotional problems, and certain personality characteristics. Age. Children born or raised in a cult grow up in a closed, controlled environment where bizarre, unorthodox, and harmful beliefs, values, and norms may be accepted. When someone leaves a cult they were raised in, that person may truly feel like a stranger in a strange land, and may have difficulty adapting to the dominant non-cult society. Cult life may have delayed emotional and educational development. It may have hampered medical needs. In addition, the person may have suffered physical, emotional, and or sexual abuse. Individuals recru recruited while in high school and college also may face specific post-cult problems. In general, this age group has much to accomplish in life, Developmental tasks need to be completed, such as individuation and separation from the family. Educational and career choices are yet to be made, and issues relating to dating, sex, and marriage remain to be fully explored. Typically, cult members do not have the opportunity to pass through these normal development, the developmental stages and experiences, and some complain of feeling like 30 or 40 year old teenagers when they get out of their cults. Certain life events or crises may enhance susceptibility to cult recruitment at any age. These include intense stresses such as divorce, unemployment or job change, entering or graduating from school, a significant loss, personal or monetary, relocation, marriage, a birth in the family or the death of a loved one. Cult membership, with its promise of relief from suffering, offers a substitute for personal mastery of these stressful life events. The relief usually provides premature, pro sorry, the relief usually proves premature and temporary at best and detrimental to real personal growth at worst. 
commonly the issues and stresses that existed before the person joined the cult are still there to be dealt with when she leaves. The resurfacing of these issues may influence how people handle post-cult life and the conflicts and emotions attached to the original stressor. I've been reading from Take Back Your Life by Yanya Lalic and Madeline Tobias. I have read to page 91, let the record show, and I will continue reading from that chapter because it seems to me to be extremely useful and prescient advice. But now it's time to unleash the green room on this most lockdown live, most coronavirus lockdown of all live streams. And we have some delightful people with us. Hello to Arthur, Sherry, Kimmy, and Sasha. How the heck are you doing? Hi, everyone. Ignore the, oh, is Arthur dressed up for us today? Hi, yeah. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Arthur, are you, are you taking your triggeringness to new levels? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but you Do know, I, I was, my Sunday dress hat. I was, I was, Good morning, I was well. planning, I, uh, I was actually planning to, to get dressed for the uh, Wednesday morning, uh, live stream that got uh, unfortunately cancelled because uh, I wanted to claim that I was uh, just coming from the memorial but uh, actually I uh, I kept my uh, my shirt and tie for for this lovely Saturday afternoon uh, live stream and uh, I'm really glad to be with you guys and with lovely, all of our viewers lovely to have you with us and how the heck are Sasha and Sherry all the way over in Australia at some insane time <laughs> <laughs> it is insane. Uh, it's uh, 20 past one in the morning on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and we thought we'd stay up <laughs> and um, spend a bit of time with everybody. <laughs> we basically well, don't have a life, so. You know, no. <laughs> well, it's really nice to see you. And thank you for taking taking one for the team, it should be said. Uh by going to considerable sacrifice to bring levity and comfort to those who are watching, uh, there are, of which there are currently 86 and lots and lots of comments coming through. Uh, Gabrielle, friend of the show, I think it should be said, says, whoa, a lot of friends today. By the way, my computer for some reason is really slow, so it could be that I'm seeing it. Ah, there it is. You're doing the Max Headroom thing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm, we might need to have Sasha go to his poetry corner early so that I can rectify problems with my computer. Um, ah, it's nice to see uh, Stephen Hassan ah! uh, in the comments. So Stephen says, take back your life is recommended reading. Well, based on what I was reading just now, and I don't know how much the green room was listening, but it was certainly very prescient advice, I think, for mm -hmm. for many who are going through that experience. Absolutely. Um, uh, let's just see here. Uh, yeah, Tony Badger. I'm I'm hoping that these comments are showing because on my computer yes. it's all very slow. Uh, it Same. says. Tony says, looking back, it took me about two years to completely rid myself of all vestiges of the cult, but the nightmares stopped immediately, and I felt a freedom I didn't know possible. Lovely to mm. so receive that comment from you, Tony. Uh, Vicky simply says, I need that <laughs> book. Well, it's a good book to have on your shelf, especially for uh, grasping what's happened to us once we've got out of a cult. Um, and what we're going to do now, if you don't mind, is um, is go to the poetry corner because oh for some Already? reason, <laughs> for some reason, my computer is so slow. Um, by the way, obviously, this is Sasha's segment, but Kimmy, if you happen to have any limericks that you oh, want to it. throw, out, <laughs> you do. Yeah, you've got. Oh, brilliant! Okay, but you may so. not know my part of it has a little joke in there that I need to do something first before I read the limerick. So ah, okay, interesting. Well, we'll see how it. that 
the line. We'll, we'll see you... how that pans out. <laughs> okay, so... How, how much uh, preparation do you need, Kimmy? Uh, thir two seconds. I just oh, got to walk God. away from my camera and grab something. Let me show you guys something. Hold on, I got a surprise. I'll give All you right, more than two good. seconds. I'll give you 30. Well, I thought Kimmy was going to go first, but all right, here we go. Now, this one I want to share is actually one that was submitted to a JW survey by a friend of the channel, a supporter of the channel, who asked that he would remain uh, nameless. Uh, he's still in the process of leaving the organisation, but he shared a poem that he wrote a few years ago that is absolutely brilliant, if I do say so. So I'd like to share this. This is, this is his words. On a trip to Paris, it occurred to me that I was raised only to see the wonderful places man ever built, God would destroy without any guilt. Amazing places that rose to the sky, all thrown down in the blink of an eye. Could it be true that God is so mad he could do something so stunningly sad? The work of genius for thousands of years, destroyed by a God without any tears? I hope that's not true, for what a mistake let himself be used by a trash-talking snake. But maybe the idea just isn't true. We live our lives, and when we are through, the things we have built, the lives we affect, then future people with us too may connect. Very nice. <laughs> Lovely poem. That was, that was really nice. Thank, thanks to our friend who submitted that to, to the channel. And uh, but that doesn't let you off the hook, Sasha, because it's is your poetry corner, and you can't just read other people's poems. So, all right, all right. Well, besides, I've got my own. I, ha I happen to know that Sherry has to go through this creative process with you to some degree. <laughs> Would that be right, Sherry? Uh, yes, I have to sit through the rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be. I, I, although I'm sure that's a very enjoyable process, oh, totally, um, completely, especially yes. when it goes on for hours and hours, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it would be a shame if all of that were to go to waste. So, come on, Sasha. <laughs> I love the way that this segment morphed over the last few weeks from Lloyd trying to throw me under the bus <laughs> to something that uh, something that's now prepared in advance. A little bit like that perfect uh, ministry school talk that we have to prepare in advance. Okay, sorry for the triggers. Here's one I just <laughs> threw together the other day. All right, here we are with another session of our lockdown live stream. So let's just mention, as everybody clearly now knows, outside just ain't a place we should go. Rather, please listen to the wise admonition, just stay inside and keep a healthy condition. Yes, it's true, this time is a test, but seriously, friends, use the time to rest because countless health professionals are out there trying to stop this damn virus from multiplying. So a shout out of thanks we give to those through these rambling verses of rhyming prose. Excellent. Wow. Brilliant. I, like it. I must Thank say, you. Sasha, you are honing your craft we're in these there. poetry corners. It's now, we're absolutely not any... brilliant. That was Certainly definitely... not anywhere. That was definitely skills, worthwhile, the many, 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 many hours of practicing that, that Sherry assisted you with there. So. Yeah, yeah, where's my thanks? Hey, where's my thanks? Because I have to sit through all of this. Thanks, babe. Sherry, you should be careful what you wish for when it comes to receiving attention on this live stream. Oh. Don't make me create a segment for you. Okay, right, Did, yeah, good point. Didn't we have one lined up, Lloyd? Wasn't there supposed no? to be a quiz? Sharing and we now to... switch to, I, I'm sorry, Kimmy, I don't yet have um, segment music for you, but that's okay. that, that will be figured out in due course. But <laughs> <laughs> what do you have in mind for us? What I have is uh, a live, but this is going to really help you, Lloyd, with your monetization. 
Oh, fantastic. It's a box. Oh, wow. That's a double whammy. A double whammy of ad friendly content right there. He wasn't too thrilled with waiting in the box, but uh, he's okay. That's I've been doing once. In the box. This is Charlie. You guys recognize him from Watch Turn Focus. <laughs> yes. That, that's a double hit of ad friendly content. Yep. Right there. So thank you so much, Kimmy. Next week oh, I yeah, may put before. mascara on a cat. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that will surely inoculate this video from YouTube's <laughs> algorithm. So thank you so much indeed. Okay, now I'm ready with my limerick. Uh, go on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, limerick. Yeah, that was <laughs> just completely... my setup for the limerick. Okay. That was, sure. that was all. Okay. Live streaming with friends can be fun. I assert I won't be outdone. I'll do anything for a laugh, even unboxing my cat for a gasp, but that's what you get in quarantine, hon. <laughs> ah, <laughs> great. Good. Very nice. This is like oh. new normal now, right? <laughs> <laughs> the new normal. That hand sanitizer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Gosh. Can I just ask, how's Mark doing? Uh, yeah, he's all right. He's, yeah. he's at his desk. I told him maybe he should pop on and show a cat. He should. Yeah. Well, show sure himself. I I know he's feeling better because he's obviously been busy with his article. So yeah, he uh, a lot of work went into that. I think it was one of his better articles. Oh, very agreed. good, very yeah, good indeed. Very yeah, so agreed. Just in case viewers don't know, uh, Mark has written an article about um, a memo that was circulated by a circuit overseer, indicating that in the event of a treatment for coronavirus that's based on administering blood plasma from recovered patients, Jehovah's Witnesses would not be allowed to receive it because plasma is one of the four main, or considered by Jehovah's Witnesses to be one of the four main components of blood, purely because it happens to be that when you spin blood in a centrifuge, plasma is one of the layers that you visibly are able to see. So yeah, one of the primary components. Yeah, according to Watchtower, not necessarily according to uh, medicine, you know. Um, so, yeah, very, very good article. And, you know, really highlighting the fact that, in a way, uh, coronavirus is now an extra way that Jehovah's Witnesses are at a disadvantage uh, and, and more likely to die, you could say, because they're more limited in terms of what treatments they could conceivably accept. Uh, very good article. Please do check it out if you can. Uh, let's just see what's happening with the comments. Uh, 87 watching today. Um, lovely to see a very vibrant set of comments, including some familiar names. Uh, my computer is still a little bit slow, so you'll have to forgive me if um, I'm a little bit slow with my... So we have Yvette watching. She appreciates... Well. <laughs> she appreciates Sherry's hair. <laughs> Nothing there about my hair, <laughs> or That's Arthur's, or Sasha's, or Kimmy's. I'm just saying. I'm just What's saying, Yvette. Us? Yeah, a little bit discriminatory, if I'm being completely honest. Um, on Twitch, Nesbo9 says, I've read Mark's piece. It's bonkers how they are justifying their rules. This might cost lives. I it agree will. entirely. Um, Brandon of the two Fiquettes, um, they have a link by the way, just just putting that out there. <laughs> Come putting on, guys, that out there. Us. Uh, damn good write up by Mark. Um, <laughs> Gabrielle and, well, apparently chomping at the bit for another segment, <laughs> but we'll come to that. Sorry, what were you going to say, Sasha? Sorry, to just while we were speaking about Mark's article. Uh, Sherry, perhaps you can enlighten us a little bit more about the discussion that you had with a leading professor here in Sydney um, during the research phase of that article. Yeah, thanks for that, Dave. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because I work with a team of very world-renowned surgeons, I spoke to one of them hoping that I could get a bit of a quote that um, Mark could use. And um, this particular individual, <laughs> I've worked with him for about 
17 years now and there was a little piece of information I did not know about him, um, which I wish I had have known. But anyway, it turns out that he was raised Christadelphian and he understood probably better than anyone else at the workplace what I was going through as I left the witness organisation. So I reached out to him, sent him, I found a Lancet article on convalescent plasma therapy and I wanted to find out from him what he thought about it. He knew exactly what I was talking about and um, yeah, was very happy to provide me with a few quotes that Mark's put into the article. Um, he confirmed that plasma is a component of blood, it's not blood itself, and that he said that uh, plasma transfusions are acellular. There's no blood cells in them. Um, they are basically that plasma is just the fluid that antibodies are suspended in, which helped me understand um, what convalescent plasma therapy is all about. Uh, and he was very happy to, to have those quotes included in Mark's article, which I was really thrilled with. It was very nice that he was um, happy to do that for us. Fantastic. Brilliant insight. Uh, nice to, and it's good that we have this, by the way, this ability as a team to kind of support each other with with research work, because obviously, due to the nature of the work that you're involved in, um, Sherry, you have access to medical professionals, and mm. just, and so I'm sure that will have been very helpful to Mark. Mm. And they, and because they know me, and they've seen. They've seen me go from being a very um, devoted and dedicated Jehovah's Witness to now someone very passionate about raising awareness about watchtower abuses. Um, they've been very supportive through the whole process, which has been really, really nice. Um, I, I just wish that I'd spoken to Professor Thompson sooner because I had no idea that out of everyone he would have understood the most and his story was quite remarkable of what he went through as he left um, the Christadelphian religion. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate where I am. Indeed. And, yeah, great observations as well about plasma. I'm, I'm, I mean, I've, I've spoken about the whole blood teaching a few times on the channel, but just how ridiculous is it that, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are living and dying according to this bizarre idea that the way blood is composed is dependent on how it reacts under centrifugal force, centrifugal yeah. forces. It's just ridiculous. And I will say too, they keep saying, you know, um, whole blood transfusions, you know, you can't mm. have those. That's like very rare that you ever get a whole blood transfusion. And the way that they describe it in those four main components, no one else does that. That's not in the medical world or in the scientific world. And then the whole idea of these blood fractions, like, this idea of fractionated blood. So this is like their own kind of story that they have mm. spun, which, you know, when you look into how does the medical and the scientific world actually define blood in these different components, it's not the same as how Watchtower does it. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Hayes says, finally got to join one of these live. Hello, everyone from Southern Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Jonathan. Um, Brandon saying thanks for diving deep for us there, Sherry. <laughs> Um, Rihanna especially appreciates Arthur's looks. Now, again, it just seems to me that panelists are being singled out for praise. <laughs> My question would be, what's wrong with how I look, Rihanna? What's wrong with how Sasha... Well, actually, never mind. How long what's wrong gone? with how Sherry looks? <laughs> and what's wrong with how, how Kimmy looks? Uh, Lloyd, so, <laughs> there was a comment. There was a comment uh, praising your beard. <laughs> Actually, I have had a comment here from Gabrielle and your wonderful T-shirt. Yes. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's nice to have a little bit of appreciation over my appearance. No one sometimes, on how I can be looks. sometimes I can be a little bit sensitive in that area. And well, Lloyd, need... Go on, we, Sasha. We know, we, we know that you know, you're, you're one who tries to shy away from excessive attention. I've, yes. I've got a little limerick here that um, might be an appropriate time to throw into the conversation, if you like. Yes, and my finger is poised on the mute button. <laughs> okay. There once was a man named Lloyd. Singing was something he'd often avoid. But no matter how hard he tried, 
the world would not be denied hearing his voice of an angel enjoyed. <laughs> I, I went to mute you, but it was too late. <laughs> yeah. to I've got that punchline in. So your viewers have been messaging us repeatedly, and I'm sure the rest of the panel will affirm that um, there's a distinct lack of singing on, on this show from, from our host. So mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm. It has been since the, the show started, actually. Mm. Gabrielle also says, I love your beard, Lloyd. That's very kind of you to say that, um, Gabrielle. Uh, Jean has a, a question, I'm sure, on everyone's lips. Uh, is Sasha and Arthur related? Perhaps we can put that rumour to bed. Yes, he's, he's my brother from another mother. Yeah, over, all the way over the other side of the world. I'm the one related to Arthur. That's yes, true. there is a claim of, of some kind of ancestral link between Kimmy and Arthur because, yeah. We're both Webbers. They're both, both Webbers, yeah. Uh, right, Abigail Eva. with a comment here. Oh, actually, never mind. Um, oh, no, 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 Louise no. Izzy says, never mind your T-shirt, Lloyd. Have the shorts made another appearance today? Oh, there's, only one way, like this. there's only one way to answer that question, Louise. Oh, no. Did he just mute actually. himself? Oh, no. And Lloyd <sighs> is showing off his shorts. But I didn't know I needed my sunglasses. <laughs> it's a lot of white there. I don't want to make too many people envious. But yes, I am wearing shorts. And I think Louise might be referring to a tweet yesterday where I said, I'm pleased to announce to the Northern Hemisphere that summer can now commence because I've put on my shorts. So I think that's what Louise is, uh, yes, is definitely. referring to. And one or two people immediately said, photograph or it didn't happen. So I'm putting that to bed straight away. Uh, we have Eric, proof. <laughs> Eric Larson saying, Sasha is on fire with the poetry. Thanks, Eric. Sherry in particular appreciates that encouragement for yeah. Sasha's poetic endeavors. So I have a suggestion after the lock stream. I mean, the live stream is done lock stream. We'll put a book together of all the poetry. <laughs> yeah. We could yes, do a, a montage. <laughs> a lockdown live stream book of poetry. Well, you Lloyd doesn't know. have enough work to do, but how about he does a little excerpt compilation from all of our lockdown live stream poetry oh. readings? Yours and mine, Kimmy, everybody that's contributed. As long as it's not Arthur singing, I'm okay. I'm just kidding, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> Jean says, I'm organizing an egg hunt in my house. I'm that bored. Uh, well, you're also watching our live stream, so yeah, things are pretty dire. Uh, I'm really hiding. I'm re really hiding all the chocolate from the husband, so I can consume it all. Devious, devious, Gene. It must be said. Um... Yes, yeah, because uh, <laughs> if there's the consummation of the age that's coming, why not let the consummation of the chocolate commence as well? Frank thinks that you're ready to go out in service, Arthur. Yes, and now we're having the field service meeting. Abigail Parker says, I suggest... Uh, sorry. Um, and yes. Moving yes. On yes. To well done, Abigail. Birnabas Collins. <laughs> Lloyd Legs, indeed. <laughs> I think I may have just broken the internet. Uh, Heidi Kelly says... Nice legs. Well, we're at the point where we're stating the obvious, Heidi, but I'll accept that <laughs> comment. True humility. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Jay Proctor says, <laughs> you know, I remember on the old JW That's podcasting it. episodes, Lloyd couldn't keep himself from singing. That voice of an uh, angel. Yeah, but I wasn't hosting it. I could I could kind of pull that one. That was kind of my like my running joke. And because I knew that James would never allow me to sing, that was just my running joke. But now that I'm actually hosting it, if I really, really wanted to sing, there's nothing stopping me because I, I have ultimate power. And because I know that this would drive viewers away uh, and I want people to enjoy the show, I am restraining myself. I'm more restrained in this, I'm afraid. 
Well, James was only just messaging me earlier saying that um, he really, you know, regrets not allowing you more opportunity to sing. He's so, trying um... to sabotage the lockdown live stream. I'm telling you now. <laughs> um, let's just see here. Uh, Jan Burnett says, managed to tune in live to one of these sessions, finally just in time for Sasha's poetry reading. And very well done, Sasha. I hope Thanks, I have not already missed Arthur's singing. I do so look forward to it. Well, Jan, your wishes have been answered because without further ado, as he scrambles for his editing buttons... It's now time for the segment of all segments, some would say. Um, <laughs> it's time for Sing Along with Arthur. Hello, viewers. Before we turn to the song of, the, of this week, of this episode, why not first open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew? Chapter Fortunately, we've lost Arthur's audio for reasons that are completely inexplicable and nothing to do with me actually having all the editing controls. Now, but, Arthur, you tend yeah. to keep us guessing over your songs to the point where, even though I am your bloody producer, you don't send me the link before the show. Where's my link, man? You, you don't need any link. Oh, really? Really. But first of all, uh, oh, the song goodness. is themed after a uh, very well-known scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So please uh, open the Bibles if you have them with you or use a JW Library app or watch our you online library. You and I are going to plummet at this point because this is and, really uh, not what... It says oh. like this. <laughs> Go in through the narrow gate because broad is the gate and spacious is the road leading off to destruction and many are going through it. Whereas narrow is the gate and cramped is the road leading off into life and few are finding it. So uh, today's song is called Narrow Roads Take Me Home. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts like this. Let's do some sleep seamless there, Arthur. Seamless. <laughs> yes. We're all about professionality here. <laughs> I'm with you, Gabriel. Do you hear the music? Almost heaven. Upstate New York. We don't hear the music. Jo you don't hear any music? No, you need to check the thing for we've had okay, we sorry. have this in every show. <laughs> Okay, you need sorry, to check. <laughs> you need to check the box that says share audio. Share audio. Yeah, Stay with I... us, viewers. Stay with us. It's worth it. So, screen. Okay, share screen. Amazingly, the viewers Grown. have actually grown in numbers during all of this. I have no idea how. <laughs> okay, that's right. Be. Growing or <laughs> grown? <laughs> yes. Cat's ready to sing along with us. Working? Is it working? Uh, Rapping. Not yet. I I can't hear any music. Do you now? No. No. Lean your microphone closer to your speaker output. Uh, one second. We could always do a cappella as we did. Uh, for the yeah, first we don't do a cappella because last week we it worked. I mean, on. <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't have. I should have. I should have said so, yes. We totally hear the music, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know it was very triggering for everybody to have that scriptural reference, but hang, hang, hang tight, everyone. 
there's there's a good relevance to this. Arthur shared with me his notes earlier, so hang tight. This is worth it. He says as he desperately tries to buy for time while emulated. Quickly... Does it work? Do you hear music? We don't know. And emulated Andy disagrees with you, Sasha. Oh. <laughs> I love your avatar too. That's awesome. <laughs> Shadow Zitos has an opinion on the show. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you you notice the fact too the cat hasn't said anything, so maybe there's some wisdom in that. Silence is <laughs> wise. <laughs> oh. Do you have music? No music, no. Arthur. Okay, now let's let's do YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Then bear with me for a second, please. The cat, cat's waving, saying hi, everybody. It's okay. <laughs> the, the cat is actually filling in for you at this point, Arthur. You are being substituted <laughs> by an animal. It, oh. It's fair to say. I think the cat yeah. may get more fans. <laughs> I'm just losing fans by the moment. <laughs> okay. I've got plenty of things I can fill in with, but right. we don't want can to have to try a segment. Can you try it now, Arthur? Yes. All right, we can hear the music. Yep. Okay. All right, come on, Arthur. You're clear to go. Almost heaven, upstate New York, Jehovah's Mountain, his life given a river. Time is short now. He preaching the kingdom through your sacred service. Glorify the Christ. Narrow roads. Take me home to the place where I belong. Warwick Bethel, Mountain Ebo. Take me home. Narrow roads. All my memories get around it Pioneering where the need is greater Doing circuits, comforting the flock Building congregations right upon the rock Narrow road, take me home to the place where I belong, Warwick Battle, Mount Nebo, take me home, narrow roads. I hear jazz voice in the dark, the star calls me, broadcasting reminds me of my home far away. Partaking of the emblems gives the feeling that I should be leaving Kevin Lee, Kevin Lee Narrow roads, <laughs> take me home To the place where I belong Warwick Bethel, Mount Nemo Narrow road, take me home. Moon she by more than fish or red bears. Trek a toy, near stealth. Mama tata, scrappy day, brushy suro. Scrafidel, Flashy Suro, Scrafidel, Flashy Suro, oh yeah. <laughs> that was, I, I don't want, I don't know what to say, Arthur. Um, rarely do we experience anything quite like that. That was Thank beautiful. You. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. It was it was an experience. I feel like I've experienced something. 
Cheers to that. <laughs> I'm still processing well, my feelings about it. What does it say that the cat was biting my hand during that song? <laughs> Get me out, out of here. Out of excitement, more than anything, probably. But didn't we have a couple of comments that people's dogs were barking along with it? <laughs> Arthur, thoughts well done, on uh, Arthur. your performance? How, how do you think that you did in that in that particular segment? Well, uh, I don't know. I really, I'm really going through the comments right now. <laughs> did you have a strong feeling about it? Do you feel do you feel like you you moved people? I hope so, because yeah. uh, that's that's the purpose of the segment to to move people. To move people, indeed. Out of uh, high controlling cults. One person who has been moved, although there's no evidence of him moving at this precise moment. Oh, there he is. Oh, we are joined by the man himself who has managed to the evade one and only John Redwood. every lockdown live stream so far. But here he finally is putting on his headphones. Mark, Hello, Mark. It's a delight to have you with us. Hey, team. Hello. Hey, how's my virus buddies? <laughs> viral and you guys are going viral. Yeah. I see. Wow. And there's there's no antidote for us. There's Sherry no and Sasha up very us. early in the morning, and uh, Lloyd and and uh, and um, Arthur. Arthur. And Arthur. <laughs> I, I I was caught caught Not off doing very well I'm looking at the squares on the so screen and they usually have the person's name on them and I didn't see them. Hey Arthur. Hey now, Mark. Oh, did you did you, you manage to get on. any of did you manage to get any of Arthur's singing, Mark? Uh <laughs> no. No. <laughs> oh, we could read it again if you like. <laughs> It's a shame. It's a shame that you left the room while he was singing. I mean, that's not something that you would think of it's, doing. Sorry, Art. That wasn't intentional. I know. I know. Don't worry. <laughs> Picking up a coffee. You can, you can you can catch the segment on the rerun. I will. I'll do that. You should do, you should do that, Mark. You should definitely do that. Heidi Kelly says we now have the six pack. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> talking. I'm sure about Mark's physique, but also about the fact <laughs> that there are now six people in the show. Um, Liet Verville says, "You guys are so funny." And Vicky Griffin Dane says, "Mark and Kimmy, couple of my favorite people. I accept their cats. I'm not sure they're giving them to you, Vicky." <laughs> Completely unaware of the arrangements there. Um, there is are you giving a... going on. She has a really old watchtower she's giving Mark, so I didn't know we had to give her a cat in return. It <laughs> seems that there were strings attached with that arrangement. Um, Frank Rizzo says that Mark missed the best <laughs> part of the show. I'm not sure whether that says something about Arthur singing or something about the show itself. Um, <laughs> I was tipped off. <laughs> <laughs> But I heard the show's in syndication and it'll be on reruns soon. So obviously, going to watch obviously. it again and again and again. Look out for it on Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> st still in talks about that. Uh, Robert Conway, uh, with a comment for you, Mark. Yeah, uh, I heard you guys were talking about that. It's kind of an interesting subject, and the thrust of the article is that the JWs are taking advantage of this coronavirus to. Kind of double down on their treat, you know, their treatment of the blood, the blood ban, and you know, I, I think a lot of people don't fully understand it. I, I don't think JWs themselves fully understand their own policy when they, you know, we used to go to the Keenum Hall and we used to sign those those blood cards every year, and if you grew up in the organization and you did it as a child, <laughs> then you almost did it. Well, of course, as a child, you know, they have I think what a medical. Um, what is it called, Lloyd? It's um, it's it's an identification card they used to have, and then the parents take care of that. And when you get to a certain age or you become baptized, you know they used to every January first at the meetings we would all sign our blood cards and get them witnessed by a couple of elders or whoever was there at the Kingdom Hall, and and that all has moved into the the DPAs. Um, 
But when you grow up with that policy, it becomes an ingrained part of your your life. You know, I'm sure Sherry and Sasha and Arthur and you know can attest to that. You know, we all we all can. We all grew up with it. So, you know, when it's that when it's that much a part of your life, um, I, I don't think enough people really think about this whole idea of fractions and the fact that you can extract something from the plasma, which the witnesses say, oh, well, that's fine. If you can centrifuge it, take it out of the plasma, then it becomes almost like a separate element that the antibody and that's okay you can have that but we don't get those antibodies unless all of these people these these thousands of people in there and by the way in new york governor cuomo has said hey we've got thousands of people coming forward to that have recovered from the virus and they're looking for specific antibodies inside the plasma of those patients who have recovered and are willing to donate their blood and they take and uh, extract those antibodies. And, and it's a special procedure. It's not just a normal blood draw, but they draw their blood in such a way that they can actually spin the plasma out of the blood while they're donating. And the red cells and white cells get, as I understand it, maybe Sherry, you could, uh, I know you, you've been in the medical field for a while. They they re-inject that or recirculate the red and white cells back into the body and they just keep the plasma. Then they take the plasma, spin that further and extract the antibodies. So if it weren't for these thousands of people who are donating this, you know, what we call convalescent plasma, then <laughs> in theory, the Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't even have a chance to have the, those antibodies, which by the way, they, they haven't extracted them yet. So you have to take the whole plasma. So I hope right, that's, that's the whole thing, Mark. They're not actually making... pulling those antibodies out of the plasma. Right. They're giving the plasma that has those antibodies. That's what they're uh, transfusing to somebody. Um, so and that's the that's their their big uh, holdup. And uh, once again, it highlights as we all are so painfully aware that we've got an organisation who are not medically trained, who are not experts in this field, who are seeking to put their opinions and their dictates and authority uh, over and above the medical professionals and those who actually know what they're talking about. And, and that obviously will potentially cost lives and has cost lives. Yeah. Did, did you guys think about that when you were growing up in the organization um you know did, did you actually think about the fractions and do you remember that that moment when when the organization came out you know and you had the charts in the kingdom ministry and they made that change where uh, you could accept fractions hmm. i remember yeah. thinking I remember. that if if i well i i made the decision that i would refuse fractions because my logic was you know our aim is to live in a world where everyone's living according to God's law. And if God's law is that blood isn't to be used medically, then in that world, no one would be donating blood. So mm -hmm. if, if, if our aim is mm -hmm. to move towards a world where no one's donating blood, why would right. I want to take advantage of people doing that in Satan's system of things? So my position, I remember when the change came about in, I think, 2000 was, I'm going to refuse fractions. So it was mm. pretty black and white yeah. for you. Mm. Now, now but as an elder, when... how how would you? You know, I, I know that. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Sasha. No, I'm just no, thinking, okay. elder. You know, you were a, an elder for about a year, Lloyd. You know, did that conversation ever come up with a publisher who maybe was grappling with a decision over understanding fractions and what to do? I, I'm, I'm, I was very fortunate during my my year as an elder, so only twelve months. But I never came into a situation where I felt like I, I was required to either involve myself judicially uh, or kind of lay down the law when it came to blood. Um, but I'm sure there were lots of conversations I had both as an elder or, uh, and a servant with people about blood. But I, I'm pleased to say that I, I don't think I ever, or at least I hope I didn't inflict my very blinkered view at the time on on others mm -hmm. um what was your what was your view sasha was yours similar well i think that that you speak to a very good point there that 
a lot of this came down to the culture of those that were influential in a particular congregation or a particular area. And I know that the culture that I experienced in many of the areas that we lived was it depended upon what the opinion of the strong elders and servants and so forth was. And we had a lot of elders who would use illustrations such as um, if you were told you couldn't eat cake, that doesn't mean you can now go and have flour, sugar, eggs and water and have those individual things. That It's still cake. Those are the main components that make up cake. And so those sort of opinions, those personal opinions, would influence many in the congregation who didn't do their own research. And so many would then just have a blanket decision of whether they would or wouldn't accept fractions based upon the influence of those uh, strong personalities that they lead. Mm -hmm. And may I say that non-Jehovah's Witnesses also were influenced. So someone like my father, who wasn't baptized, um, who had a, a little understanding of what Jehovah's Witnesses believed, he actually was told by an elder that while my dad could not be given a blood card, he could take my mother's advanced directive and write it out for himself, word for word, and then sign that document and keep that with him. So you know, my dad smokes, he gambles, you know, he doesn't go to a lot of meetings, but this man five times refused blood because that's what was accepted, you know, expected of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He felt the pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's really weird that he carried this handwritten, you know, directive around. Well, he was told by the elders yeah. to do that. I remember when you and I were first talking about that and uh, I had left and you were in the process of leaving and we were talking about it and uh, you pulled out some of my old bound volumes and there was a bound volume that talked about blood and it was a watchtower teaching from, it was the late 60s or early 70s. Yeah, 1970. Right, which said that uh, the transfused blood of a criminal could cause the person who received that blood to likewise become a criminal or a murderer or inherit those traits. This is the this is the junk science that Watchtower was injecting into the minds of hundreds of thousands or millions of people even back then. And your father was a direct uh, recipient of that because I remember we were talking about how you know, you said that that affected him and that actually, even though he was never baptized, that created an unusual fear in him of blood. And Jehovah's Witnesses do an incredible job of instilling fear of blood tra transfusions. The The journal, I, I want to share this is kind of interesting. I just thought of it. Uh, the journalist who wrote the Atlantic article last year, Doug Quenqua, um, when he was finishing up that article, um, we actually were driving downtown to visit uh, some friends of ours uh, who are one of them is an XJW who became a doctor. And we were kind of on the subject of medical things it's right after my father passed away. And uh, and I said to Doug, you know, we were just talking about the blood thing because he didn't really know that much about the the witness blood doctrine. And uh, he said to me, well, you know, when I was a kid, I had leukemia. And I said, really? Uh, I said, that, yeah. He said, I was, you know, 14 or 15 because I had asked him, have you ever been to Baltimore before? And he says, yes, I came down to Baltimore, you know, I think to Hopkins to get treatments uh, for leukemia. And I said, well, that's fascinating. So you have been to Baltimore before? And he said, yeah. He said, I would come down here uh, and I received hundreds of uh, blood transfusions and it saved my life. And he said it was awful because many of the people around me died. He said I was one of the lucky ones who survived. And uh, he said something to me that I've never heard anyone say before. He said, Mark, when I got those blood transfusions uh, for my leukemia, I felt like a new person. It was like... Um, it was like getting reinvigorated with life and oxygen and blood once again. And uh, I think the reason I've never heard that before is because I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness with this um, horrible stigma attached to blood transfusions and how you can get all these diseases. And I remember even sharing that information with non-witnesses about the transmission of AIDS and other things that, that was, you know, our minds were being filled with a lot of junk science. And then he comes and says to me, it made me feel so good. And not only did it make him feel good, but he survived it. So, you know, I think this that many of us were just born with that stigma associated with blood. And it's um, it lasts a long time.
Mm. And yet we were told, we, we as witnesses developed a, an inherent arrogance because we were told that we had the best education and the best research done on our behalf by those who were, wrote the articles. And we didn't put the effort into research it ourselves. And, and I think that really speaks to something that affects not just us as Jehovah's Witnesses or former Jehovah's Witnesses, but the world in general is that people are so quick to accept uh, information without doing their own factual research. You know, the, we, we keep stressing that um, the only way to really be, be sure of things is to do our own in-depth research and, and develop our own, um, our own skill set, not just accept things that are given to us. And so the religion really highlighted the fact that they just gave us a prescribed viewpoint on things. And we willingly accepted that without any thought about clarifying it or, or authenticating it or researching it, or as you say, work out whether it's junk science or not. Indeed. Uh, quite a few people weighing in on that question, which we, we pondered briefly as to how we responded to the fraction's position when it came out and we were believing Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, Alyssa R.N., says, I was super young um, and I thought it made no logical sense and I still don't. Uh, Abigail Parker... She became a nurse, <laughs> yeah. it appears. Right, yeah, indeed. Abigail Parker says, like Lloyd, I remember and I could not switch over. No blood meant no blood. I would refuse fractions. Eric Larson, with what many would argue is a logical reaction, um, I remember thinking, phew, there's more treatments I'm allowed to take. Mm -hmm. I was never comfortable with not accepting blood. That was probably the, the uh, most uh, often thought uh, opinion, just like Eric said, that, well, they are, they are loosening the, the strains. On us. You, you you would think so, but when when things are a quote unquote conscience matter, um, sometimes the thinking can be, well, I'd rather err on the side of caution, you know. And uh, the, I, I, I don't want to risk. Yeah, I don't want to risk my relationship with Jehovah just because right. it's not about what I'm allowed to do; it's about what's the right thing to do. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, and would you be classed as a spiritual person in the in the congregation's eyes if you did something that maybe broached uh, breached your conscience? So again, there would be a judgment um, that would affect your standing in the congregation, even if it technically was okay to do. However, elders should elders should apply Romans fourteen when uh, handling such matters. What, what, <laughs> you gonna read us the scripture? <laughs> what? Go, Go on. Read. <laughs> Go on, Arthur. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Romans fourteen talks in, in Romans fourteen. Paul talks about these conscience matters. So, if if some if a publisher wants to accept a certain thing what other another publisher might not accept because of their conscience elders should not judge the one or the other that, well, there's that's no, true there's no hard and fast rules though as to what scriptures elders would or would not read people yeah. yes. it must be said yeah but if i were an elder i would uh, take such an approach you seem to be chomping at the bit for that very eventuality <laughs> arthur uh, go on mark well he is wearing a tie <laughs> he is yeah <laughs> yeah well you know i mean first of all obviously you know who decides what's the conscience matter and that's the whole point of being mm. indoctrinated by the witness organization or being in a religion is that they actually are deciding what's a conscience matter so you know they're giving you this uh they're uh, the decision made in 2000 or thereabouts was very interesting because they're making it seem like you've got a choice. Oh, now, you know, some may choose to accept these fractions. Others' consciences may not allow them to accept those fractions. But you have a choice in the course of your medical matters. And, and this is where it really gets into the infringement upon a person's medical decisions in life. And that's where religion becomes very, very dangerous. When they, when they lay down these rules, that affect your life. And, and I want to say this, not just the medical rules, but also the, the HIPAA in, infractions or the, the, um, uh, the invasion into 
whether or not the elders know that you made such a decision. Why is mm -hmm. it that they would know whether or not you accepted fractions or a whole blood transfusion? Um, <laughs> we know that they considered a disassociation offense, which means the same as disfellowshipping, right? You're shunned and everything, but why would they know in the first place? Right. There's a privacy issue at play. There's a privacy issue at play. And what I found interesting in, in talking to different doctors after I left the religion and other pe and other witnesses, in fact, who have told me that they did accept a blood transfusion privately. Now, I think most of us probably wouldn't, you know, would have been faithful to it. But at the same time, you know, they were the smart ones. It's a fine line between, you know, your faith and loyalty to what you believed at the time was God's organization and loyalty to life itself. Hmm. I think someone so, commented actually on uh, it might have been on Twitter earlier today. Uh, someone commented that uh, you know silver linings with the coronavirus pandemic, at least with social distancing, uh, elders are limited in the extent to which they can ambush people at their bedsides and coerce them into uh, refusing blood. However, oh, I put that you, in my article. Oh, oh right, it's probably. Also, in, Probably they were they were mentioning that part of your article then. But having said that, if you find yourself hospitalized during the coronavirus pandemic, you have other issues to be thinking about yeah. than, <laughs> than whether elders are going to be turning up. Um, Brandon Fiquette, touching on the whole point of the conscience matter, um, it was always mm. regarded as a difficult subject to wrap your head around, and any deliberate digging always ended up being tampered uh, with a combination response of it's a conscience matter and we don't want to stumble others. Yeah, that's what I think life in general as a Jehovah's Witness revolved around. It wasn't just about what your conscience dictated. It was about how your actions or decisions could be perceived by others. I will tell a funny little story. It's very quick. When I was pioneering, um, in one month I was studying with a couple people and that's when we were using the... Um, the require brochure and um, I went back to someone's house and they didn't answer the door for our study and they had the brochure tied to a bag on their door with a note that said um, that we they weren't going to study anymore they had read the part on they read ahead and read the part on blood and they said they weren't going to let their children die and then I went to my next study and they also quit studying all over you know the the blood and as a witness it, it was it never even never even dawned on me. I just thought, you know, it was such a protection for us that God knew better than us. But it was really funny that in one month I had two studies quit because they both read ahead in the brochure and learned about the blood policy. Deal breaker. Um, Deanna, Deanna Moreno says, veiled choices give the illusion of personal control, but the conscience matter makes you feel prodded in the way they want you to respond. I think that's well the gist said. of it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, Fox Pudica or Puditsa uh, says, I volunteered for a bone marrow registry for several years and hearing stories like your son's, I think probably re responding to someone else in the live chat, um, was so cathartic and uplifting. It helped me feeling like I, it helped me feeling like I was healing from having held such awful beliefs. Um, and Abigail Parker with a comment for Arthur. Yeah. Arthur, don't forget the millstone. Jesus said better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be hurled into the sea than to stumble others. Yes, true. That's, uh, that's also a, uh, a awesome, uh, an awesome principle. Abigail, our savior. Abigail encouraging Arthur in his triggering ways. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I, w I wanted to say that Fox Puditsa was uh, replying to Margareta's comment there. Uh huh. Okay, I'm kind of scrolling up rather than scrolling down. So yeah, Margareta Kvikstrom uh, said, "My son uh, have survived two leukemia thanks for blood and stem cell transplant." Mm. That was the original comment. I yeah, and, you know, really, and I think, yeah, go, go ahead, sorry. Sasha. Sorry, Mark. I was just saying that what that really highlights is the value of human life and why life obviously needs to be looked after and protected. I, even if we want to subscribe to the idea that life is a gift from God. And, you know, they, 
the witnesses will go to a great length to say that uh, blood symbolizes life. Blood is the, is the representation of life. And it always stuck in my throat. And I thought of an illustration back even when I was a witness, that if your house was burning down and you had the opportunity to either save a photograph of your child or your child, which one would you grab as you run out the door? Would you grab the photograph of the child or the real child? Obviously, the answer is clear. And here we have a situation where witnesses will try and save the symbol of life rather than the damn life itself that's sitting there in the hospital bed. Yes, because they know that Jehovah can bring back their loved one to life in case... Yeah. By, by means of loyalty. Well, okay. I, I won't be triggering yeah. anymore. Sorry. <laughs> Mark Coronich says, I never even thought about questioning taking blood. Now I'm so glad I'm awake because who has the right to say what you can or can't decide what your conscience should be? Well said. Hello, Mark. Yeah, well said, Mark. Well is said, Mark yes. in Australia, is he? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Another person who's up at 20 past two in the morning. Yes. Sure. A sucker for punishment on? there. You, you well, know, it's a frightening... Sorry, go on, Mark. Oh, it's okay. Uh, well, I was just going to say, you know, it's a frightening thing if you've ever gone up against surgeries, and I've gone up against a number of them, the last one being the most serious. I had a thoracotomy uh, a few years before I left the religion, and I literally put my life in the hands of qualified surgeons. Um, and I've had surgeries all the way back to, you know, age 20 when I was in front of an, a, a group of uh, oncologists that we didn't know if I had a, uh, uh, a cancerous cyst inside my sinus. And I, you know, I was in the hospital, you know, for a while as that was taken out. And fortunately it was benign, but that it was not a really bloody surgery. But the fact was that I had to sign all of these documents and papers. And, you know, I was 20 years old and, you know, I was a young, frightened JW. I wasn't even old enough, you know, I, I wasn't 21 yet, so not old enough to, to buy a drink. And yet I, I was, had signed this document of loyalty to Watchtower's blood policy. And uh, the real scary part is going up against the anesthesiologist because they're there to help you and keep you alive. Yeah. But that's where it gets really frightening because the anesthesiologist is usually the one that you know, will say, look, we've got to got we've got to administer blood while while they're also is that correct, Sherry? You're yeah. you're saying yes. So the anesthesiologist is uh, in that position where he does not want or she does not want a, a patient dying on their operating table and they're trying to save your life. But I remember being so frightened by the way that how stern this anesthesiologist was about basically saying to me. You know you're uh, you know you're willing to lose your life, and w if if uh, you we had a blood vessel and you're bleeding out, and you know, and I had to answer those questions at 20 years of age to an anesthesiologist, and then fast forward over 20 years later when I had you know a thoracotomy, which was you know the r r ripping your in insides out, and there's a big scar across my back, and that that could have gotten really ugly, and I know Kimmy remembers that pretty well too because my parents were there you know and it was just a whole scene with the doctors and the anesthesiologist and you know I just trusted I, I think what it was was I, I trusted I'm in Baltimore and we're near Hopkins and we have really good hospitals and a lot of witness patients are not so fortunate mm -hmm. you've got witness patients who are in uh, you know countries that don't have the developed medicine that we do in in Sydney and Baltimore and, and other developed you know, places where if you're a witness, you, you know, you, you may just die because they don't, not all hospitals have a cell saver if you start yeah. to bleed out. In fact, even hospitals here in the United States, many of them do not have a cell saver. They have to go and call another hospital and order a cell saver and have, and you know, not, many hospitals share these cell savers between hospitals because it's just such an expensive piece of machinery. So it, it's a frightening thing to go up against an anesthesiologist and say, I'm willing to lose my life over this what terror blood policy. And that's when you have to say, this is my belief. And then inside your mind, you're thinking, is it really? Is this really what God wants me to do? It's, it's mm. a scary thing. Well, 
Indeed. We're all very glad, and I'm sure Kimmy particularly, but we're all very glad that you're here and that you you got through those situations. And we know yes, sadly definitely. that there's been so many who didn't and, and their whole life has been deprived of them. And it, it's heartbreaking to think that this situation continues in this modern day and age where witnesses are not being given the right to think for themselves. It's really tragic. Yeah. Amanda Rich says, my mom had a severe reaction to a blood transfusion and was convinced for the next 40 years that blood doesn't really save lives. So you have these kind of urban legends that get circulated. It all amounts, of course, to confirmation bias, doesn't it? They, they don't want blood to be um, a positive thing, something that can save lives. So they will leap on any evidence whatsoever that it's yeah. actually a threat to life instead. I just have to comment that, of course, Amanda's mum was alive to make that comment. Mm. Indeed. Indeed. Oh, and speaking of, I think, Amanda, is she okay to talk about the uh, the letter, uh, Kimmy? Is she? Uh, well, we could talk about the, the letter in, in yeah, general. Yeah, we can just talk about the letter in general. Just talk about the general, yeah. So, well, we received, and I posted this on Facebook, so it's not an article, it's just a Facebook post, but uh, there's a congregation in Vermont uh, that <laughs> uh, an elder wrote a letter um, in which he revealed that several, uh, I think it was two people in the congregation in Vermont, right, had contracted the COVID-19 virus. And among the other things that he said was, oh, and this is on Reddit too. I think I posted it on Reddit. We got permission to post the contents of this email, which the, the elder sent to the entire congregation, basically sternly warning them to not only obey the superior authorities, but more importantly, to obey the elder's uh, direction, because the implication was in his letter that congregation publishers had broken what uh, broken the rules that the elders had told them and they had caused or likely caused this uh, the other people in the congregation to come into contact with a COVID-19 positive person and then they the elder went on to say that if you do such things you know you may be found blood guilty so here they were this elder this congregation body of elders uh, was basically saying laying the blame it's it's victim blaming because we don't know we we know how the virus spreads but we don't know in specific instances uh where whether you got it from you went into a supermarket and there was a particulate in the air that was kind of hovering around over someone who coughed or breathed it can happen lots of ways that's why we have so many people getting sick and we're wondering how in the world did they get sick you know they and weren't was- around that many people yeah, and in that letter, right. nowhere did it say, you know, they felt bad for the two publishers that had the yeah. disease or, you know, could they, is there a way to help them? It was a stern reminder that you had to follow their authority and direction. They knew better. And if you don't, not only could you get sick, but you could kill other people and be held accountable for it. Yeah. Jenny, Bar- Jenny Barrett has another angle to this. Uh, I nursed a Jehovah's Witness who had lost a lot of blood during a very long operation. His HB level was 35. It should be 120. I was, I think, is that hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. Um, I was so scared he was going to die on me. I think that uh, it's the impact psychologically on medical staff who are doing their very best to save people running up against this insane prohibition is not to be underestimated, is it? No, and I can speak that because I I know what the surgeons go through, what what all of the clinicians go through. They they are there because they want to save life. Um, they're not suggesting treatments willy nilly, but they they're trying to save life. Um, I had an experience a few years ago with my father who had had a fall at home. He'd fallen in the bathroom and fractured three ribs. They punctured his lungs and he was bleeding internally. Uh, He was rushed to one of the major hospitals here in Sydney and it was quite a bewildering experience because we were standing in the ER while all of these doctors were around him and the cardiothoracic surgeon came in just at the time that my father's blood pressure started to skyrocket 
and they realised that they needed to get into his lungs now and drain this this blood that was collecting or he wasn't going to survive. And so right in front of us, um, they had to pierce the, the lung with this huge syringe and um, they drained out two and a half litres of blood. And, of course, they were talking about blood transfusions because he had his blood volume had plummeted so much. Um, and I, I look back now and I think of how kindly those doctors dealt with us. They did not say what they really thought. What they ended up saying to us that night, he was admitted into ICU. Um, they said to us, there's nothing more we can do if he has another bleed we'll be calling you in to say goodbye Wow! if if you're not going to accept blood. Um, and so we went home expecting that if we got a phone call that that would be it. Um, and the HLC was there. The HLC was there before I even got there. Um, but, yeah, the doctors were just remarkable in treating us very professionally. Um, he survived, obviously, but... Um, I do really feel for for the clinicians in that role, the nurses, because they just have such feeling to want to help people. It has to be really hard when they know there's a treatment that's going to cure and help someone and that person is refusing it. Yeah, I, that, that's really hard when you're watching your parent go through that. Um, circling back to my dad, after we left, it took a little bit of um, work for me to kind of get my father to understand why he refused blood. And so when he had his last surgery, which in order to uh, fix his back, they had to go in through the front and, you know, there was a chance they could cut the aorta. Um, and my father told the doctor that now he would accept a blood transfusion. Um, my father's surgeon cried. He went over and he hugged my father and he said, I'll do everything in my power not to have to give you a blood transfusion, but knowing that you won't die on my table, you know, meant everything to him. And that, that surgeon cried and hugged my father. And uh, you just realize that they're not e evil doctors, that they, they no. just want to save lives. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And now on that note, uh, we, I was just going to say, like we, the whole reason we're having these lockdown live streams because of, of coronavirus, but again, this is a great opportunity to say thank you to all the surgeons and the medical staff that are working tirelessly around the world in ways that we can't even imagine, um, just as, you say that these are individuals who have a heart of gold who want to hug their patients and take care of people yeah. with absolute sincerity and selflessly and again to anyone who might be watching or has family members who are working in the health field uh, our sincere thanks and appreciation for everything mm -hmm. that you're doing at health or affiliated fields thank you you're saving lives indeed now we do uh, try to include as many uh, well We've obviously included a, a number of the comments from the now 98 who are watching along on Facebook. Uh, but we also try to include uh, voicemails and video messages. I do have a video message, which I will attempt to play. Please bear with me. Again, I don't have a producer. <laughs> I'm doing all this as best I can, but uh, hopefully you'll all be able to hear this message. Hey there, Lloyd and Arthur and anybody else from the, the survey crew that's, uh, that's seeing this and everybody on the live stream. Uh, this is Jay from Germany. I just wanted to say thank you to, uh, well, to everybody. Uh, thank you, Lloyd and crew, for the work that you do. Uh, thank you to the fans. Oops, my computer's <laughs> slow. Sorry, apologies for that. Jay should be with us again shortly. His garden looks a bit like mine, actually. ...and the patrons for uh, supporting that work. Uh, today is the 7th of... Oh, gosh. Sorry, my computer... This was, this was with the, the technical issues I was having earlier. I do of apologize. April, and it's just after sundown, which means it is now XJW. Oh, I'm going to let it buffer, I think. <laughs> gosh, that is so irritating. Pride day. And I already had a slice of uh, slice of buttered. Let me just take it back because it's a really lovely message, and I, I want to do it justice. We'll try again. Hey there, Lloyd and Arthur, and any. Oh. oh, it's 
it's not working. You might try to lower the resolution first. While it's doing that, Lloyd, I can fill in with something else while it's buffering, if you like. But I'll sure, um, I'll just everybody. try and lower the resolution, but if you want to share something, Sasha, by all means do. Yeah, if, um, if I can just um, chat, most of us, of course, well, nobody can travel at the moment. <laughs> we're, we're all locked down, but we can travel virtually. And I just, I've been doing a bit of a deep dive onto the internet of some really great photographers and um, people who, who just share some fantastic uploads. So I just want to share a couple of things. There's a YouTube channel. I don't know if you can see it here. Um, YouTube channel by a fantastic uh, photographer who explores abandoned buildings and, um, and, and natural beauty around the world. His um, YouTube channel is called Alex Blor, as in explore, Alex Blor. Um, so that's, that's his handle. Check out his videos. He, he looks at some fantastic abandoned uh, buildings, ships, uh, things around uh, uh, natural sites. That's his Instagram account. So if you'd like to explore the world without having to actually go anywhere, um, just jump onto the social media, have a look at some fantastic photography, some really great work that he does. Um, and then, yeah, it just takes you down a little rabbit hole of, of exploring the world whilst we're still in lockdown. Um, it's, it can be a really positive thing to do just to look around and see at some of the, the beautiful photography and videos that he's uploaded. There's one little Thanks, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. Hey, so thank let's, give it, let's try Jay's message again. Hey there, Lloyd and Arthur. And oh, this is a reduced resolution. <laughs> Anybody else from the, the survey crew that's, uh, that's seeing this and everybody on the live stream, uh, this is Jay from Germany. Hi, Jay from Germany. I just wanted to say thank you to, uh, well, to everybody. Uh, thank you, Lloyd and crew, for the work that you do. Uh, thank you to the fans and the patrons for... Uh, supporting that work. Uh, today is the 7th of April, and it's just after sundown, which means it is now... XJW Pride Day, and I already had a slice of uh, slice. It's a buttered toast, and uh, <laughs> here's a, a beer, and I'm wearing the scariest Iron Maiden shirt, or at least that would scare the hell out of my mom uh, when I was younger. Uh, in honor. That's awesome. He had himself a memorial, didn't he? <laughs> For that. So, yeah, happy XJW Pride Day. Thanks. Thank you so Lovely. much, Jay. And I, I do Thank really, you. really apologize Thank for you, butchering mm. your very lovely message yeah, uh, due, me to, due to my technical problems, which again delayed the beginning of the show. But um, unfortunately, my computer is really playing up at the moment. Uh, but please don't let that put you off if you intend to send in a voicemail hopefully by the next show i will have my technical gremlins sorted out so <laughs> the address for uh, voicemails is as follows speakpipe.com forward slash cedars and i'm going to let the cat <laughs> out of the hat i don't even know, know what i'm saying now. <laughs> let, let the rub let the rabbit out of the hat with my um uh, by showing my e email address, and this is for if you want to send through either a 30-second video clip that I can play actually directly through the software, or if you want to send a longer message like Jay attempted to do, then we'll show it on the uh, video screen share. But that takes us more or less to 90 minutes. Uh, it's been a delightful discussion, albeit on a very grave subject, but one that's been, I think, on a lot of people's minds, particularly after reading your article, Mark. Um, and thank you so much for joining us on for the first of what I hope will be many uh, lockdown live streams in, on which you grace us with your presence. 
Always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, we don't have a specific, uh, you know, it's a little different from the Watchtower in focus where we don't have to beat down a specific subject and we can just talk about whatever we want to talk about while we're all imprisoned in our homes. Indeed. <laughs> but it's nice and to see all of you. I don't think Arthur and I have, and I have communicated <laughs> quite a bit, but I don't think we've ever had a face to face before. So it's we've nice had to... we've had on one of the Watch the Rain Focus episodes. That's right, we did. We did. Uh, Thank you for correcting that. <laughs> I, maybe it's just that I haven't seen you in a tie. Maybe yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You're either in a tie or a mankini. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, th those are those are completely different video conferencing <laughs> sessions that Mark and Arthur have had. So yeah, nice. we don't want to get sidetracked into all of that personal stuff. But thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, we, we should keep it PG. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We should keep, keep that between let, yourselves, let me, guys. And let me just share one one last thing that everybody might enjoy doing if you're locked at home and you want to have a laugh. We've had a fantastic laugh um, with Arthur's sing along. But if you want to get into some more of the song parodies that are doing the rounds on the internet, uh, YouTube a fam or a YouTube channel called the Holderness Family H O L D E R N E W -E S Holderness Family, and uh, have fun having a laugh with some parody songs that will keep you company during this whole lockdown time. Yeah. So I just want to give a big thanks again to this awesome panel and to, I'm going to try and get this right. Is it Booty the Cat? No, this one's Charlie. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, Boots was last week. Okay. This is Charlie. So thank you, Thanks Charlie. Thanks for joining us, Charlie. <laughs> for, for inoculating this video against YouTube's aggressive algorithms. <laughs> um, Thanks to Sasha and Sherry for appearing, albeit in an extremely sleep-deprived state. Uh, may, your caffeine, <laughs> may your caffeine be bountiful tomorrow morning. Uh, Mark, great job on the article. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for covering that important story, and it's been a pleasure discussing it on this lockdown live stream. Arthur, uh, thank you for appearing. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and for singing so, so thank you to all of you it's been a fantastic show hopefully all 80 to 100 who've been watching have found it uh, enjoyable but also uh, we hope that you're enjoying it over on youtube when it finally manifests itself on on that particular platform so <laughs> thanks to all of you and I hope you continue to have a very enjoyable weekend. And we'll see you in the next show, which will be on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So please join us for that if you can. Thanks, Lloyd. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. team. Thanks, Lloyd. Bye, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. <laughs>